Hi, I'm Sheila McManus. I'm one of the board chairs with the Teaching Centre here at the University of Lethbridge, and this is another Ed Talk. And today I'm talking with the other board chair from the University of Lethbridge, the outgoing board chair, um, Dr. Harold Jansen, also from the Department of Political Science. So a question that I don't think we've ever actually answered on tape is, what is a board chair? And what do we do? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm entirely clear after having done it for two, uh, for two years. Uh, the board chair was a position created uh, by the Board of Governors to recognize uh, sort of excellence in teaching and leadership in teaching. And essentially your job is to try to uh, provide some leadership in teaching over the, the term of the appointment. So I worked very closely with the Teaching Center on a lot of different things. Um, to me, I sort of saw it as, as sort of my job to be an ambassador for teaching. and. Uh, over the last two years, I found it just to be a great opportunity to have lots of amazing conversations about teaching with people who I don't ordinarily talk with mm -hmm. teaching about. I found a lot of people would buttonhole me in the hallway and go on rants about things. And, <laughs> and, and that was fun, actually. It opened up some great conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, like, there's a lot of people I talk about teaching with, but they tend to be like-minded and they, they love teaching as much as I do. But to get to talk to some of the people who you don't ordinarily think of mm -hmm. uh, has been a really fun part of the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once it's announced that you got the position, like you say, like the random hallway conversations mm -hmm. kind of begin. And people pay more attention to it than you think. But to me, yeah. I mean, there, there's always this tension in universities, and we try to pretend it isn't there. But let's be honest, it is there between research and teaching. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a real emphasis on research, and there's Board of Governors research chairs. and. Um, I give credit to the board here for also recognizing the teaching side of things with the teaching chair position. To me, it's a tangible, tangible commitment that teaching matters to mm -hmm. this institution. And to try to build a, a bridge, I'd be the faculty face between you know the amazing staff at the teaching center and the broader faculty community. It, absolutely, I think that's that's really critical um, because there is there is this thing about staff telling faculty what to do. And mm -hmm. there's things that we can get away with telling each other that uh, staff just can't get away with. Um, <laughs> I think that's true. Tenure's a wonderful thing. Um, so, so I think that's important that a lot yeah. of times what, what the teaching center staff really need are some faculty allies and champions for mm -hmm. various kinds of initiatives. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What have been some of your favorite parts of the job from the last couple of years? I mean, of all the different once you become board chair, you sort of promptly get involved in so many different activities through the teaching center. What has been the best part of the last couple of years for you? I think it's mostly just the people. I mean, the the faculty who get attracted to the teaching center who get involved are, to me, are just some of the, the best people at this university. They really are. I, mean, I agree completely. I, yeah. <laughs> I'd say that even if you weren't one of them, but uh, when I think of all the faculty, we have amazing faculty at this university, but the ones who, there, there's, there's a degree of selflessness, I think, to be a good teacher, and the kind of people who mm -hmm. want to be good teachers really have to care about other people to be a good teacher, I think. And so those kind of people tend to be drawn to the teaching center, and I'm just amazed at the number of people you'd ask to do things, and, and the word no doesn't get said mm -hmm. very often, or often enough in some cases. Um, so I think that's, and the, the staff at the teaching center, they're just absolutely an amazing group of people. If there's, a, if there's a better administrative unit on this university, I have yet to run across it, and there's some really good ones here, but the, the people at the teaching center are just phenomenal. The way they really genuinely just want to want to help people and yes. do a service, and the way yeah. they'll drop everything. I mean, I, I've had teaching emergencies usually involving technology not working in the scale-up room, and I've I placed one phone call. I've had two people in my room within five minutes mm -hmm. troubleshooting things for half an hour and like drop everything to help you in that sort of commitment to service. It's just mm -hmm. unbelievable. So yeah. it really is the community around the teaching center. And I know uh, you've been a teaching fellow and, and I was too before I did this. And there was a real sense of loss when I wasn't as intimately involved <laughs> in that community. Like I really missed it. And I've enjoyed being like right in the center of it again. And mm -hmm. I think that's the thing I'll miss the most It's just, an incredible community to be yeah. a part of. So what else inspired you to get more involved, whether it was originally what inspired you to become a teaching fellow and then take the next step of wanting to be uh, one of the board chairs? I've always, I mean, I've always loved teaching. It's just something that uh, is just endlessly challenging to me <laughs> and uh, in, in a really good way. I mean, you never feel like you're done. So there's research projects where you do them and you kind of finish them mm -hmm. and you move on. But teaching, I mean, there's courses I've been teaching for, I mean, close to 20 years now, and I'm still 
they're getting better, but yeah. they're, they're never better. And every time I teach, it's a different group of students in a different room, sometimes at a different time slot, and I'll change the curriculum mm -hmm. up. It's always new and dynamic. Uh, so I always really loved teaching. And I don't know, just trying to find my niche in the university, where mm -hmm. you fit in. I mean, it's a big thing. There's lots of different places to get involved. I remember sitting at Arts and Science Council once, and Shelley Wismath, who was the very first board chair, mm -hmm. came up and did a little presentation about what the teaching center did and mentioned they were looking for teaching fellows. And that was just this epiphany moment for me. Like, <laughs> that's, that's it. That's what I want to do. Yeah. So I emailed Shelley and I said, could I meet with you? And I'd like to learn more about this and put in an application. I got involved helping with graduate students because mm -hmm. so much of the graduate student programming was focused on natural sciences. And I'd done a lot of work. And the social science and humanities people were wanting something. So I'd done a lot of work on class discussion and had had a lot of experience with that. So I started doing a session for them on that, mm -hmm. which I've done every year for the last seven or eight years. Yeah, so that was sort of my, my bridge in. And then, uh, yeah, then I missed it a lot. And so when this opportunity came up, I mm -hmm. jumped at it again. But I mean, the teaching center is the kind of thing where you're never, you're <laughs> never out, right? Once you're in, you're, it's a life sentence in, yeah. in, in a good way. Yeah, but, I'm assuming you, know, you attend fewer meetings once your term as board yes, chair is done, yes, but exactly. anything you care passionately about, you can still care Absolutely, about and still yeah, stay there's involved. There's lots of ways in. to get involved. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so I hope I'll still get to do my discussion thing for the graduate mm -hmm. students, which I continue to do even when I wasn't formally involved. And uh, yeah, I'm imagining my work on the, uh, Lee project will continue. And, and the uh, Lee project is? The learning uh, environment evaluation mm -hmm. project. So that's something I got really involved with uh, as board chair. So I mean, the big realization that uh, started with Jan Newberry, who is my predecessor as board chair, and the realization that we design a lot of classrooms here without actually talking to the people who teach and learn in them, right? They're designed by architects and building maintenance people, mm -hmm. and they're concerned about things like fire codes and mm -hmm. um, all important things and, and safety standards and mm -hmm. all that stuff, but not about are these effective spaces for teaching and learning. And we also have the challenges, the nature of university teaching is changing, where it's, yes. there's more people moving away from lectures to more active style learning. So the Lee project started to start studying, well, what kind of spaces work well and what don't? Um, and especially with the destination project uh, mm -hmm. looming where we're hoping to build this new building and then renovate University Hall, that's gonna fundamentally transform teaching and learning spaces on campus. So it's, it's an opportune time to start studying this. So they're involved in uh, creating pilot classrooms and um, doing research, what classrooms work well, what, mm -hmm. which ones don't and why. Mm -hmm. So it's been, yeah, that's been a, a big part of mm -hmm. what I got involved with. So. And I know one of the goals of the Lee Group and the Teaching Center broadly is down the road, it would be nice to be able to uh, connect the teacher with the style of room that they want and not exactly. just mere proximity. You know, at the moment you get assigned classes that are close to your department or your office and they're not. And they it's might all driven not, by room size. It's yeah. driven by room size, yeah. yeah. Instead of teaching style, wouldn't yeah. it be nice if we could get to that point? So I know you teach a lot of active learning, even in large classes, right? So almost all our 50, 60 seat classrooms are lecture style, right? Yeah. And yeah. that they're not optimally set up to have people, I mean, uh, there are some crazy instructors like you who you don't let that stop you and have students and yourself climb over furniture as needed. But it'd be nice to have spaces that actually match the instruction. So it's, it's actually a pretty profound problem. It's not just room design, it's the way we book rooms. It's, it's uh, quite, it, it, it's amazing once you start pulling out the threads of this mm -hmm. problem, how interspersed it is through all kinds of things through the university that need to be changed to make this work properly. But it's nice to see that there, there's a will to tackle this. And I know from conversations with colleagues at uh, other universities and colleges, a lot of them are having this realization. And from what I can see, we're way ahead of the curve in most universities and actually doing research and trying to use evidence to make some of these decisions, what works well, what doesn't. So it's been, uh, yeah, it's been a big project. And it's tied into also a shift in my teaching where I've sort of embraced things like flipped classroom and more active learning as mm -hmm. well and realizing bumping into the classroom problems mm -hmm. that, I've, that, that I'm experiencing firsthand. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's, it's very important work actually. 
I want to ask you about both of those. Um, both, you're probably one of the first faculty members at U of L to really embrace flipped classrooms. Um, so maybe I'll ask you about that first, and then later on I'll ask you about your experiences in the new scale up room okay. this year. But the flipped thinking about a flipped classroom came first for you. Tell me about that. What, what, how did you make that decision? How did that work for you? I uh, teach this course called Introductory Research Methods, and half of that class is statistics, st social statistics, and uh, political science students hate math. Uh, <laughs> we'll just say it. I mean, there are always a few. There will be two or three in any given offering who embrace math mm -hmm. and aren't scared of numbers, but most of them <laughs> will say, this is a common quote, if I liked math, I wouldn't have majored in political <laughs> science, right? So I have run into huge obstacles on this. So I, it really bothered me, and I went through a number of different iterations. When I first started teaching this course, I would lecture at them about social statistics, which is about as exciting as it sounds. I saw the look <laughs> of horror in your face there. And yeah, it, it did not go well. I tried that only twice, I think, and just realized, now this isn't working. So then I decided to move to a more active approach where we'd go into a computer lab and mm -hmm. we'd fire up a statistics package and I'd lead them through, well, let's do it, right? I figured if they did it, it would stick better and be a lot more engaging. So I, I started, so I usually taught the class twice a week. So one day a week, we'd go into a computer lab and I'd lead, lead them through the steps. And I thought that worked better. They were more interested and engaged. But what I found is their, their learning, the, the mastery of the material just wasn't there. So on hmm. the exam, they weren't doing very well. The average was about 50% on, on that part of the exam, which was distressing. So I tried to switch the way I was doing the lab. I'd be more enthusiastic and excited, <laughs> and yell louder and do more things. And nothing seemed to make much difference. And then I'd also have a final assignment. And I found they couldn't, it was, they just didn't even know how to tackle that last assignment. And what dawned on me is they were really good at me telling them, okay, go here, click here, mm -hmm. now click here. Now you see you read this line. When they were following my instructions, mm -hmm. Uh, they were really good at following instructions. They were very good at listening and doing what I told them to do, which is great if I was going to create a personal dictatorship or something. <laughs> I have well-trained minions. It's always a possibility for a good teacher. It is, yep. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was creating this army of minions to go and rule the world. But as far as people who actually knew how to do social research, it wasn't mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. So this haunted me. It really it bothered me, and I kept trying different things in that lab to make it work, and it just wasn't working. And so I was on leave, which is a good time to, I mean, you're supposed to be working your research, but I also find it gives me a bit of time to reflect on teaching. Being away from it, I mm -hmm. actually find it energizes mm -hmm. my teaching as much as allowing me to do research. But I remember I was reading, of all things, Wired Magazine, and there was an article mm -hmm. about the Khan Academy, which is this online site yeah. of videos, video instruction, and that parents often use for their kids if they're not understanding math concepts. I know I've done that with my son, they doesn't understand something here. Read this, watch this video. Mm -hmm. But in this article, they talked about this flipped classroom thing. And the basic idea is what we traditionally have done is we use in-class time where the instructor lectures or mm -hmm. teaches. And then out of class, students work on assignments, which they hand in, and then we pass judgment on how well they mastered the material. But the revelation is what a waste of time when you're together with your students to spend your time Mm -hmm. lecturing. There's other ways to deliver that, such as video. And then in class, have them work on the assignment. That way, if they need help, you're there. And it was really focused a lot on math that that had been effective. So it got me thinking, this might be the solution. Uh, so I decided, I'm going to try this. So I committed to it. And there were times where I regretted because it consisted of me producing a bunch of videos, right. which I had no experience with. So uh, now, look, looking back, my first stop should have been the teaching center. So, <laughs> big lesson to any of you who want to do this: stop, go talk to the teaching center, talk to Todd first. Do that first. Do that first, <laughs> not halfway through. Uh, lessons learned. Anyway, but I figured it out on myself, and I like computers. I like technology, so mm -hmm. I figured out how I was going to screen capture what I was going to do and edit these videos. So I produced a series of videos. And I committed to doing it, and there were times where it wasn't because I was spending probably 20 hours a week recording video, editing it, rendering it, uploading it to YouTube uh, for my students to access, then creating the assignments that they would do in class. But it was amazing to watch the success, and that's what kept me going because mm -hmm. initially students were kind of a little skeptical, right, because mm -hmm. they'd have to watch this video. I said, I'm not going to teach you anything in class. You're just going to come and work. 
And uh, so they were a bit skeptical at first, and I just had to explain. I said, okay, there's research that suggests that this will help you learn better. I said, you've got to trust me on this. There is a <laughs> lot of educational research that says this will work, mm -hmm. but you have to do the work. And so the first class, I remember I'd see people Googling stuff. I'm like, why are you Googling it? It was all in the video. And they didn't watch the video before coming to class because I don't think they really believed I was not going to teach them <laughs> in class. They did that once, and then they realized, no, I really wasn't going to, going to teach them. They had to watch the video. And then they'd work through the assignments. And what was really amazing is I remember having, there were a couple of students who just really struggled with basic computer things. And I could spend extra time with them, mm -hmm. helping them with the basics. They just really struggled. And I had a few really smart students who were really good at math. They were the ones who actually weren't scared of math. And I'd remember one student who was a double math political science major, but I would teach him extra stuff, right? right. And uh, show him some extra things that weren't really necessary, but I could tailor the instruction much more. And even things where students generally got it, but sometimes a particular explanation in the video didn't work for them, mm -hmm. well, I could explain it a different way. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was remarkable. It was, I mean, exhausting. Those classrooms running around helping people were just draining, but <laughs> in a really good way. Yeah. I just felt very satisfied, like I'd really taught people. Those, that one-on-one -on -one instruction was great. And I opened it up, students could come after class and if they had trouble, and some of them would do, and then the assignments was really neat is because they were doing these assignments every week, they knew when they weren't understanding things right mm -hmm. away and they would come and get this instant feedback um, that maybe they didn't understand things. So when they got to that big assignment at the end, it was so exciting because they knew what to do. And they were trying, I actually had to rein them back from, <laughs> from trying things that were probably way too difficult because they were almost too confident right. in what they could do, which was <laughs> a really nice problem. And on the exam, they did substantially better, right? They did, the average was more like 60 to 65%, I think, uh, somewhere in there. And uh, so that's, that's a huge increase. Mm -hmm, Any educational mm -hmm. intervention that gets an increase like that, that's substantial. So then the next year, I re-edited all the videos, which took a lot less time, but still quite a bit. I re-recorded certain sections mm -hmm. that... I wasn't happy with, and I produced another little video, that a summary video at the end. And uh, yeah, the average is close to 70%. So yeah. I got a huge increase in, in actual outcomes, same kinds of questions, yeah. and they mastered it so much better. So it was, I mean, the most work I've ever poured in because it was half of one class. Um, yeah. But boy, did it pay off. It was yeah. just amazing to see. And the students, I said, were initially skeptical, but they'll almost routinely come back to me and say, you know, it was really helpful because when they're working on an assignment, I don't quite remember how to do that. Well, they can go back and just fire up that part of the video mm -hmm. and watch it again when they're preparing for the final exam. They can mm -hmm. rewatch anything they need to. They can't go back and relive a lecture, but the video is very helpful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's the flipped classroom experience. And uh, I loved it. It was just, it's just amazing. And for a while I was like going crazy. I wanted to do <laughs> Flip video, <laughs> flip classrooms for everything, produce video for everything. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's, it, it worked really well in that situation. How come more faculty don't do it? Or if you could give some advice to people who are thinking about it, but maybe a bit concerned about the workload, there's the payoff in student learning. Why aren't more faculty trying at least this? That's a good question. I mean, I, the big thing is it's a scary amount of work. And I think had I realized that I was going to be spending 20 to 25 hours a week on it for a term for half of one of the classes I was teaching, yeah. I might have thought that's, I might have thought better of it. There are ways to do it faster, which again, go talk to the teaching center because I found there was software that would have made this a little faster, but it mm -hmm. still takes a lot of work. Lecturing is easy. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what it comes down to. It's how most of us were taught. Mm -hmm. We know that's what, we know how to do it. I remember something you once said that stuck with me at a, at a teaching day years ago, that teachings are, uh, that lecturing is a really effective teaching method, may not work so well as a learning <laughs> method, right? And so I think for us, it's, it's often the easiest way to do things. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I think that's what it comes down to. We have a lot of pressures on our time. I mean, yeah. I can sit and why don't more people care and put the time in? But <laughs> I mean, I look at the amount of time I spend going to meetings and... Um, trying to keep your research going and mm -hmm. all those sorts mm -hmm. of things. And then to blow 20 hours a week on half of mm -hmm. one class is a bit mad. But what's really nice about it is the payoff is there. This year is the yeah. third year I did it. I didn't have to do anything to the videos, right? I, they were all done. Right. Uh, so now all that investment has paid off. Right. I've still got the student, yeah. the improved student outcomes, but 
the um, the workload is the work is done. Did you ever get much pushback from your students where they felt like this was now making them do more work? So instead of having the one hour they could just come listen to you, they now had to do the hour of listening ahead of time and show up to class prepared to work. Did they feel like you were making them do more work as a result of this sort of pedagogical flip? They may have. They didn't complain to me about that too much. <laughs> but they, they'd come up with tricks, and students are really smart. Like one of them said, you know, I found that they could speed the video up and watch it at one and a half times or double <laughs> speed. And, and they, they could figure out what was happening and, and follow it. And they found ways to sort of figure out what to do. And, mm -hmm. and that's all right. And the first videos are longer. The later ones got a little shorter. Because I, I had to learn at first, because when you're lecturing, well, one of the major ways that you lecture effectively when you want to hit a point home that's important is you'll repeat it. Yeah. So you'll say it again. Because yeah. you really want to make sure that you repeat things to get that the point is important. Yeah. But in a video, you don't need to do that, right? right? You can say it once, because if they didn't understand it, they can rewind it. Right. So I had to learn a lot of that. But no, I, I, they, at least they didn't complain to right. me about it. I, but I, I always had to explain to them that uh, this was going to work. They, I, just trust me. I've mm -hmm. done this before. Mm -hmm. I know what mm -hmm. I'm doing. It works. And I mm -hmm. will tell them the statistics about how much better they're going to do on the exam yeah. if you buy into the program. Yeah. Right? If you do the work, you will get this. I also make a point of during the labs when we're working, and it's really fun to see about three, four weeks in, I'll point to them, remember how much you struggled with this four weeks ago? Like mm -hmm. recoding variables, is that, that lab's just a gong show the first time. It's the most <laughs> intensive thing they've done. And I'm so tired by the end because I've got like 15 hands up and I'm running yeah. around the room trying to help everybody. But by four weeks in, they can do that effortless. Okay, mm -hmm. recode the variable this way. Click, 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 click. They're done. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll stop them and say, do you realize how far you've come, like mm -hmm. you could not do this. So I'm constantly trying to point where we've come from, what, what they yeah. were at, and I get the buy-in. With the lab part, I also build in some flexibility. Mm -hmm. I tell them, if you come to the lab, I will be there to help you. But I give them two days to do it. If it doesn't work for you, you can do it at home, you can do it mm -hmm. on your own time. I just can't guarantee I'll be there to help you. So. There's a lot of flexibility about when they watch the video, about right. uh, when they do the assignment. And so I think they appreciate that as well. Yeah. And then, so your innovation in the last year was, again, you were one of the first faculty members to kind of, to sign up for the new scale-up room. And I'm not going to get the whole acronym right. I finally learned it. But tell it, well then tell us what is a scale-up room and then tell us what did you do when you finally got to go play in that room? So the scale-up room, scale-up stands for student learning, a student-centered active learning environment with upside down pedagogy. Okay. Horrible acronym. Horrible Only an acronym. academic could come up with that. <laughs> But upside down pedagogy is basically flipped classrooms. So yeah. the scale up room is this amazing new classroom we have on campus. It seats 36 people and there's six tables, each of which will six, seat six students. And there's a big TV screen at the end of mm -hmm. each table, which uh, students can have access to. And they can all plug in laptops and they can project their work. And the idea is that you're going to do a lot of active learning in mm -hmm. there. So what I did is I moved my whole research methods class. So what I had been doing is on the Tuesdays and Thursdays, Thursday would be the stats lab, the flipped part, we, which we previously were holding in a computer lab. And Tuesday, we'd hold in a regular classroom. And sometimes we'd do active learning kind of things, like designing a survey. Other times, I would still do some lecturing as much as I've just dissed lecturing. I still would do some <laughs> of that. So what I did is we moved the whole class in there. And uh, I really focused on trying to make the Tuesday part much more active mm -hmm. learning, where we were doing methods. So um, that was a really neat neat room to teach in. It was tailor-made for what I wanted to mm -hmm. do almost. And I didn't even get to design it. But if I were <laughs> to design a classroom, it would look much like that. So what's cool about that is I can have the students, so for example, we might design a survey and I can break it down into different parts. Different tables will work out things together. And then one table can take what they've done and they, we can share their screen with everyone else. And, and mm -hmm. we can uh, share screens across like that. So it's really well suited to um, this kind of active learning. Mm -hmm. And I used a lot of the technology, so they do a lot of work on laptops. Typically they'd bring their own and then they could just plug it in and decide whose screen was, was showing and we'd critique each other's work. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a pretty neat classroom for that. Um, I wasn't totally satisfied and I never am, I think, the day I ever teach a class from 100% yeah. happy will be the time to <laughs> drop the mic and leave or retire, I'm out of here. And I don't see it ever happening. 
I, I'd never incorporated that much active learning into a classroom before, mm. and you've done a lot more of this than I have, actually. Um, but I found what I did not do well is we do a lot of activities in class, and then by the time we're trying to share, mm. that sharing part takes a lot of time. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> so I would introduce the activity. I might spend 10 minutes setting up the activity. They would work for, say, half an hour mm -hmm. on something, and then we'd share it. By the time we went around, we'd be out of time, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't get a chance to draw all right, what are the big conclusions we should draw out of this? And I did not do that part. I didn't leave myself enough time for that. Mm -hmm. So I need to work better at figuring out how to do that. So I'm back in the scale-up room next time. So I've got some ideas. I think I want to do a, a wiki out of class, again, right. imposing on my students' class time, but mm -hmm. require them all to write something on this on Moodle where they talk about, here's what I learned from this. Here's the lessons I learned about this particular research technique. Mm -hmm. And then from that, we'll build a, I basically have the class together construct mm -hmm. the lessons. That way it doesn't take class time to do that. Mm -hmm. And if basically all I'm going to be doing is asking them, so what did you learn from that? And then write it on the board or something. I might as well do that outside of class. That's mm -hmm. not the most productive use of class time. So I'm going to try that. But this room is, is amazing. What's disconcerting about it is you're standing right in the middle. <laughs> you're, you're teaching in the round, which mm -hmm. is a disconcerting experience mm -hmm. at first. So... And you're always circling around and circling around and walking from table to table. Yeah, and yeah it's, it's crazy how, uh, how that feels. So if you go in that room and you're trying to lecture, uh, you're doing it wrong. Right? Right. That's not really what it's you should be doing. It's a waste of the doing. room. Yeah. And I did. I will confess to having a couple of classes where I just got really behind because of all these activities that I actually did have to lecture just to get caught up to be more mm -hmm. efficient. And it was a really weird experience of <laughs> circling round and round and round yeah. and trying to keep an eye on all my students. But uh, it, it's, a, it's an amazing room to teach in. It really yeah. is. It's like, what would you say, because we have colleagues who say, well, the one downside of the room is that there's no front. Yes. Right? There is a, there's a middle. You are teaching in the round in that sort of very she experience sense. There is no front. Yep. Um, how would you answer, is that an actual failing of the room? It's just you have to think about how it's, it's matching the, the teaching to the room again. Yeah. If the focus needs to be on you for large chunks of your class, it's the wrong room to teach in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, for this class, I really tried to emphasize it was about doing stuff. The way, to me, the way to learn about research and, uh, and the joy about teaching research methods, it's about how to do research. Mm -hmm. And so the focus is on doing. So the focus is, I told the students, is on you doing things. Mm -hmm. It's not on me telling you about how I've done things. It's about you mm -hmm. doing things, right? So I deliberately tried to take the focus off me. And that's what the room should be about. So if you need, if, if you're teaching style, and there's lots of teaching styles that require more focus on the instructor, sure, and that's yeah. entirely legitimate. Yeah, yeah. But if that's what yeah. you want to do, you shouldn't be teaching in the yeah. scale-up room because it's not well-suited for that. There's other more active learning kinds of spaces that do still preserve a front sure, of room that yeah. allow you to rearrange tables. Uh, so we've got a few classrooms here that the LEAD project is set up that I think yeah. could do that. But to me, that room, I mean, you, unless you kick people off of one of the tables mm -hmm. to create a front of the room for yourself, it's just not going to mm -hmm. kind of work. But again, like I said, I think if that's, if that's what you need and that's your complaint about the room, then you're using it wrong and you should be in another classroom. What's tough is, is the technology piece. We don't have another room with the, the technology quite the same yeah. way. And if you want to incorporate the shared screen kind of mm -hmm. uh, thing, we don't have a room that has front of room and shared mm -hmm. screens for tables like that. Yeah. And that's a really cool feature of that room. I use that a lot. Yeah. yeah. What else do you think people need to think about as they're, if they want to use the scale-up room? So part of it is, okay, so there's no front. Yeah. And if you're, in, if, if you're teaching style, if you need that front for any length of time, the scale-up's not it. But something else you've been talking about is you've got to really, to make the best use of that space, you've got to really think through what you're doing in that space. For you, you were able to build on what you'd already started working on in your flipped classrooms. Yeah. What else do you think people need to think about? If they want to go teach in this scale-up room, what are some of the other things that they should think about? I would say rethink a lot of what you're doing in your class. Like, how can you translate this class into something they can do at a table? And especially, it's really well-suited for group work. The mm -hmm. tables that they sit at, they sit three people per side. And those tables are, they're, they're magic. That's the only way I can describe <laughs> it. They're exactly, students have just enough room. They're just far enough apart that it's comfortable, but mm -hmm. close enough together that there's this real sense of community. And it is amazing mm -hmm. the communities that form around those tables. So I let my students choose their own tables. 
and they sat there like they were so bound by where they sat. Mm -hmm. Students generally are creatures of habit that way, but even more so. And what I really laughed about, the final exam for that class was in an ordinary lecture <laughs> room. And if I looked, they were sitting by the people they sat with in their table. Even when it's completely yeah. different context, it built these little learning communities. So really think about how to leverage the power of those communities, mm -hmm. uh, those communities that form, how to leverage the power of group learning is something that's really worth thinking about because it's magic what can happen. And what I've, what's really struck me a lot about group work from this and talking to other people who have taught there is, I think part of what makes the group work work well is students are notoriously resistant to group projects mm -hmm. and group work. But what they really don't like is being evaluated as a group. Mm -hmm. They like to be evaluated as individuals, but they don't mind group work as a tool to help them learn. And so if you treat it that way, that the group thing is gonna be a tool to help them learn, then that works really well. So thinking about how you can preserve individual level evaluation, mm -hmm. but leverage the power of groups to help them learn, I mm -hmm. think that's very effective. So in the flip part of my classroom, I tell the students, I don't mind if you help each other. I don't mind if you work together on things, if that's useful to you. And I find students go back and forth working on their own on some things because that's more efficient. But if they're stuck on something and because I don't have a TA, I'm running around trying to deal with 30 students on my own, it can be a while before I get there. So mm -hmm. we'll often ask each other. And it's, it's helpful for someone to explain something to someone else at their table. It helps them learn and it's very effective. So I tell them, if that helps you learn, go for it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, again, it's learning to leverage the power of groups and thinking through what that means. How can you use mm -hmm. groups to facilitate learning? Mm -hmm. I've got another class that I'm putting in there from in September that I'm designing I've never taught before. So I'm thinking about it from the ground up for scale up. So I've been thinking about this a bit and that's one of the big things I'm trying to toy with is mm -hmm. how to come up with things that let them use groups but still let them be evaluated as individuals. And also for me, I, I like using the technology and mm -hmm. how you can use those screens because to me that's what's really mm -hmm. powerful about that. They loved having their own screen and it provided a focus of attention when they're creating a document together that they can all see it really big on the screen and someone's going to be typing and controlling it but they could all see it and point to stuff. Mm -hmm. They really like that and uh, so thinking about how to use the technology as well is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not going to use the technology, there's other rooms that you can accomplish Again, many of the yeah, same things. Yeah, right? movable tables in L1050 or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. There yeah. are enough of those rooms on campus, but there yeah. are some. Yeah. So to me, if you're going to be in scale up, you should probably think about how to use the technology most effectively right. as well. Yeah. So if you're not going to do the group thing and you're not going to use the technology, well then, yeah. if you're not going to use the group thing beneath the technology, computer lab will work just mm -hmm. as well. And mm -hmm. if you're not going to use the technology, then you might as well be in a room that just has movable yeah. tables, L1050, or yeah. the room whose number I always forget in Down W5. Over here, W5 something. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the embodiment of all the really kind of good cutting edge pedagogical stuff these yeah. days. You know, it's about seeing, you know, I've talked about um, lecturing is one tool in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. It's not the only tool in the toolbox. And if it's the only one you're using, maybe try something else. Yeah. And what I like about the scale up room, although I haven't gotten to teaching it yet, is that it forces you to think, put that one aside, think differently about it because you're physically in such a different space and your students are in a different space. And as for well. me, I mean, it's not, I mean, I love the scale up room and it fits, but I'm teaching two classes this fall, but I only put one in there partly because redesigning two classes at the same time is mm. madness, but <laughs> um, also because I had one that fit. Yeah. So it's the course I'm doing is a digital politics class. So it's about how computer technology changes the way we communicate and engage politically. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the technology piece is central to the subject matter. It makes sense. The other course it wasn't as relevant, so I'm not going to clog right. up the scale up room just because it's cool, but right. I use different kinds of pedagogical tools that are appropriate for that subject matter. And that's, to me, what, what I've thought about. I think the toolbox metaphor is a really, really good one, right? There's, if the lecturer is a trusty old hammer, there's a, there's a lot of times where uh, hammers and nails are really effective building tools, mm -hmm. but there's other times where other things are maybe more effective. You might need to have a cement mixer, you yeah. might need a saw, you might need a screwdriver, right? And yeah. thinking about what's gonna work for this group of students, for this subject matter, for this class size. Right. And that's gonna vary. And yeah. it also varies by instructor because yeah. 
Yeah. I know I, I'm still learning how to do the group thing. I'm not as effective at it yet, uh, partly because of my deeply ingrained resistance when I was a student to mm -hmm. any kind of group projects. And mm -hmm. so I've had to learn how to overcome that and try to figure out, well, what, what do I like about groups? What works better? So I'm still learning how to do that. Lecturing mm -hmm. is easy. Um, I know how to use the hammer and nail very, very well at mm -hmm. this point. Yeah. But. It's no accident, uh, I think, that both the flip classroom and the scale-up room, it's been thinking through your methods classes. And you and mm -hmm. I have talked a lot about um, teaching methods and how to teach methods better. What do you think the connection is there? Um, that there's something about teaching methods courses that can perhaps lend themselves to more innovative pedagogy or um, innovative use of space. What is it about teaching the methods class? It's funny that I've, I've sat on salary tenure and promotion committees and they always talk about when they notice somebody teaches the methods <laughs> class, it's known as, oh, that's the student evaluation killer, right? <laughs> that students hate taking it. And um, I mean, I, I got stuck, stuck teaching it because when I was being hired, they needed someone to teach it. <laughs> I'll teach it, I'll, give me a job, I'll, I'll teach it for you. But I came to really view it as a challenge. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, it's this really cool thing. And like the upside of it is that it's, it lends itself to a lot of active learning. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to embrace active learning, it's tailor made for that because we're teaching you how to do stuff. I think the way, to me, the reason it does is, is in research methods, we teach a lot about reflecting on why we do what we do, right? Um, why do we do the research that we do? Why do we choose particular research instruments? Mm -hmm. How do we evaluate evidence? What's convincing evidence? What's not convincing mm -hmm. evidence? That's really what methods is all about. And, and I always highlight, or I try to highlight in my research methods class that there isn't one perfect method for anything. You pick the best tool, and often any tool we use is not perfect, but it's the, most, the best, most defensible mm -hmm. method, and, and figure out why you're doing it and be prepared to defend it. Well, if we're thinking critically about our teaching, that's exactly the skill set we should be applying to our teaching. Yeah. Is thinking, well, why am I teaching it this way, right? What's the most appropriate method to teach this particular thing? And to reflect back on, well, what's the evidence that I'm gathering that my students mm -hmm. are actually learning effectively? Um, and then reflect back, how can I improve the methods, right? It's, to me, it's just mm -hmm. built into the scientific mm -hmm. process more naturally. So I think there's a really natural fit if you take methods seriously, I don't know how you can't apply that to your own teaching. And I, that's why, um, I mean, some of, some of my colleagues I see at the uh, university more broadly, I'm not singling out my department because I'm the methods person, but they're really committed to good research. But I'm surprised that same level of reflection doesn't seem to apply to the teaching side of things, yeah. right? It'd be like, oh, there's this really great scientific technique we used back in the 1940s, it was awesome. <laughs> And that's how my professors, professors were taught and it worked really well for them, but we're not gonna change that, right? But no, we wouldn't do scientific studies that way. If there's yeah. new tools that are more yeah. effective, we use them. Yeah. Why yeah. wouldn't we apply that to teaching? Yeah. So I think methods lends itself to that kind of critical mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm if you take it seriously yeah. and take the teaching set seriously. Yeah. So. yeah, we were on a panel recently where someone compared teaching the methods course to doing a tour of duty in a war zone. Yeah, I exactly. was slightly bothered by that, <laughs> <laughs> by that analogy because for those of us who love teaching the methods courses, yeah. it's the, I would regard perhaps other courses as more challenging yeah. or sometimes hazardous and life-threatening to teach, not the methods course. But, it has um, this, but it's got this, that perception. It absolutely does. But if you, I don't know, to me, it's just the ultimate teaching challenge. Like I, yeah. the thing it's more I do like find, a resort than a tour of duty. The thing really. I do find is students come in with a lot of resistance yes, to it. Yes, absolutely. And I'm sure you've experienced that as well. They mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. and, and for me, they, they want to come in and study political science. But now here in this course, which we're making you take, we're not actually going to study politics anymore. We're going to study how to study politics. Yeah. So it's a step yeah. removed from what they're really interested in. Yeah. And so getting the buy-in from them is really hard. And then... Just also part of the problem is the logical thing to start with is, well, different approaches and, and mm -hmm, political science mm -hmm. like history has, we don't have one agreement on different ways to do things and they're driven by deeply held philosophical assumptions. Mm -hmm. So we started this very abstract thing where we think about thinking about how to study yes. politics. So we're, yeah. and that's, I mean, that's really tough. Yeah. It, so I can see that. But to me, it's like, wow, if I can make this work, 
I can teach anything, yeah. right? That's, <laughs> that's kind of how I approached that yeah. for a while. I want to build on a comment you just made about how we don't, in, in exactly none of our research lives would we say that the way we did it 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago is acceptable. Why do we continue to say that that is somehow acceptable pedagogy? Why don't we hold teaching to the same kind of standard that we hold research? I think it's changing a little bit, at least sure. at this university. I do see some evidence yeah, of change, absolutely. and that's, there's yeah. no question that the standards are being raised a little bit. And I, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. But I mean, again, it comes down to that broader institutional focus. I mean, research is what drives things, is what brings mm -hmm. in money. Although if you think about the amount of tuition that students pay and what a lot of our funding from provincial governments is because <laughs> we actually fund, we actually educate students, yes. right? So if you actually yeah. thought about where most of the money comes in for university, it's not research, it's actually Mm -hmm. th directly or indirectly because we, we teach students. But it's, it's always been the, the red-headed stepchild, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just using that expression. But, uh, Sitting right here. I know, I just uh, pick on me. But uh, it's always been the, uh, the uh, uh, now I can't think of another <laughs> yeah, Good luck finding a better analogy metaphor. now. <laughs> but it's always, it's always been the weaker partner of the right. two, I, I think. Um, but, I mean, I, I have seen, and this has been part of the great part about being board chair, I, I have seen these conversations. And by more publicly recognizing through the Distinguished Teaching Award, through teaching yeah. fellows, through board chairs, there's starting to be some recognition for teaching. Mm -hmm. And it makes mm -hmm. people, and I've had conversations with people who are kind of defensive, right? And, and, they're, yes. and well, yeah. I, I'm not judging you, right? This is just something that I've, put a lot of effort into and I mm -hmm. really like and care mm -hmm. about. Um, and this is not a judgment of you, but people are feeling, I've, I've had a com few conversations where people seem to be a little defensive yes. and it's, it's interesting to see that. Yeah. So it does have that effect that yeah. we are expecting a little more, it's a little more thoughtfulness about mm -hmm. how, how we teach things. And mm -hmm. I've seen it around salary, tenure, and promotion cases where yes. there's some serious, more serious discussion about why people are teaching the way they are. Yeah. Uh, how, how do we judge whether somebody's been, been an effective teaching, teacher or not? I've seen the growth of the community around teaching as I remember going to the very first teaching day at the university and there were you know, 50 people, which was a pretty good turnout. Mm -hmm. But we had like 100 people at the teaching conference this yes. year and that was yeah. really cool to see, right? Yeah. There's this growth of this community of people who care about teaching and, yeah. and that's, yeah. that's exciting to see. Yeah. There's conversations in the hallway that are happening. Mm -hmm. And that's it's building. There mm -hmm. absolutely is momentum about this. And I'm not saying research is not important. No, it's, for sure. Yeah. It's absolutely yeah. critical and to do good critical research, but yeah. we should hold our teaching to the same standard. Yeah. And we've talked a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I would agree with you that the tide is sort of slowly rising. Yep. And I get quite cranky now with, you know, kind of broader cultural narratives about all oh, the quality of university education is declining. And then it's they look true. at massive universities where you've got 500 student first year classes being taught by an underpaid grad student. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, not at my university. Yep. In fact, no, the tide is rising here slowly but surely. Yep. And we've also talked about we can't, it has to be incremental. It has to be word yep. of mouth. You can't make a faculty member do anything. Thing. You can try to induce them to maybe, you know, have a bit more fun um, with their teaching. We've talked, some of our conversations at the Teaching Center have also been about um, embracing our failures and having to admit when things haven't gone well. What are the, some of the things that you've tried that have not gone well in the classroom? And then what have you learned from them? This is the well, epic fail part of the, the conversation. Epic fail. <laughs> I've had many, many failures. Often there, are, I, I haven't had too many just gigantic, like just absolute abject failures um, where an entire class has gone off the, like an entire course has gone off the rails. And, and even on things where I'm more or less happy, there's always things to improve. Like I, reflecting yeah. on my research yeah. methods class that I just finished teaching that, okay, I need to improve that. I'm always keeping a little journal of, okay, next time. Yes. This didn't go well, this didn't go well, this yeah. didn't go well. And I think that's a really, good thing for people to do is just keep track of the things that worked well and didn't mm -hmm. in the course. But some of the biggest failures, I remember I taught a course on representation and electoral systems, which is something I did my PhD thesis on, and it's an area I really, really like. And, uh, and so there's this, there's this approach to uh, representation electoral systems called um, 
uh, social choice theory about how we make optimal decisions. And it's based a lot on economics. And it's not central, it's sort of this little side area. It's mostly economics literature, not really central to the kind of stuff that I was interested in, but it's part of the area, so I have a class built up on it. So I'd worked really hard the first few times I taught it to build this read up, make sure mm -hmm. I had a really good plan for this. And, and we did really fun, we'd worked through some really fun examples that produced these paradoxical outcomes. Well, what I had, uh, I was really rushed. It was, I was teaching, I taught it for like, the, it was the fifth or sixth time I taught it. Oh yeah, I know this. <laughs> I'll just go in and teach it. And I was getting the examples messed up and I was trying to explain things. And no, oh no, no, that's not this paradox, that's this paradox. <laughs> the whole class, it was 50 minutes after 25 minutes. I mean, this is just an epic disaster, but I've got to go through with that. So I carry it it all through and it was just so bad. I was mm -hmm. just so unprepared mm -hmm. and um, this, <laughs> I, I basically just said at the end, okay, let's forget this class ever happened. <laughs> I just told them, I said, none of this will be on the exam. Let's just pretend that this never happened. And I just wanted to slink out of there and this really nice student kept, it seems really complicated. <laughs> this area was like, it's okay. This seems like it's really complicated. Math is hard for everyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> math is the math is difficult, and I was just uh, I was just mortified. And they were taking pity on me. That's how students are so nice sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so the big lesson from that is always read through your notes and make sure you're prepared, even if you've taught it five or yeah. six times. Think through what you're going to do, and be prepared. Don't think you can wing it just because you've taught it many, many times. Yeah. And I've really always tried to make sure I leave, even for something I've taught 15, 16 times that I will take at least 15 minutes to go through my notes, refresh myself yeah. on what I need to do. And if it's an area I'm not strong on or I want to update, spend more time. And I really do try to update my lectures every or classes or whatever, yeah. every single time to mm -hmm. incorporate newer examples and look for opportunities to do that. Mm -hmm. But boy, that was, that was painful. Another one I had, this was as a grad student. I, I really like having lots of class discussion. Mm -hmm. And in political science, we deal with some things that are controversial. So I remember having a discussion about multiculturalism policy. I just read this book on multiculturalism policy and, and was quite critical of Canada's policy towards multiculturalism. Thought, oh, this is really an interesting debate and discussion. I, I'm gonna throw this out to my class and see what happens, right? So. Anyway, the smart part of me should have immediately thought about how culture is very closely tied to issues of race and racial issues quickly become controversial. But <laughs> some part of me, the part of the academic part of me that gets excited about new ideas, didn't quite see the uh, potential potholes. So my class ended up into a screaming match about 20 minutes into the discussion. They were yelling at each other and it was got really out of control. I had to shut the whole discussion down. Um, so it actually, uh, a really important lesson from that was learning when to see the temperature rising and to mm -hmm. anticipate mm -hmm. the danger zones. I still think we need to talk about controversial topics, but learning to be very, very careful about how it's done and to keep the conversation constructive. And mm -hmm. I don't mind reasonably frank exchanges. I don't want people to lose their temper and I, I want people to keep focused on the ideas and never to get personal. Um, but to learn how to manage it in such a way that we avoid it blowing up. And yeah, I learned by having it blow up. But yeah. I think yeah, yeah, it made me a lot more respectful of what, what could go wrong. Yeah. And then there's times, yeah, just poorly worded exam questions. You had an exam problem this year. Didn't you have poorly worded oh, exam Oh, no, I had, I experimented with a multiple choice exam this fall. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was, some of those I used a lot of, multiple choice questions from a test bank from the textbook. And they were terrible questions and they didn't go well. So that was, yeah, learning how to do that is, is fairly difficult. The way I teach is not multiple choice kinds of mm -hmm. things. But mm -hmm. again, we're, faced, we're facing budget cutbacks in a very, very large class. Uh, I didn't have the time and I didn't have the grading support to be mm -hmm. able to grade essay or short answer exams. So I thought I would try this as a tool and it did not go well. It gives me a lot of respect for people who come up with good multiple choice exams. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a tough skill. Yeah. As dismissive as I've been of multiple choice exams. You do them well, <laughs> and I don't think they're easy to do well, and I'm not convinced most of them are done well. But yeah. if you can do them well, I'm, I'm in great admiration of you. But I've asked even essay questions. I've mm -hmm. asked cute essay questions, right? I remember asking one, is regionalism real? 
um, which is asking about Canada, about regionalism, whether people's regional differences. So do people, are people in Alberta really that different from people in Ontario? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or is this sort of a feeling of attachment that our provincial governments create among their citizenry to build a support base when they're battling the federal government mm -hmm. trying to get things in the federal system? And that's really what I was interested in asking. There are these two different ways of understanding regionalism. And, which one is a more compelling mm -hmm. explanation? So instead of asking the question I just asked you, <laughs> I got really cute. Is regionalism real? I thinking, oh, that's ever so clever. And after reading about 15 answers, none of them understood <laughs> any idea what I was asking. So ask, ask a clear question. It's yeah. a really good strategy. Yeah. Don't be cute. Don't be clever. There's times to be cute and clever. Asking final exam questions is not one of them. So yeah, yeah I mean, you learn a lot from, from mistakes, and I still constantly make mistakes, yeah. and I'm always reflecting. There's, like I said, the moment I ever teach a course where I'm satisfied, I'm mm -hmm. out of here, mm -hmm. but I don't think it'll ever yeah. happen. I think it's the mark of a good teacher as well, because you're willing to take risks and try something new. New classroom, yep. you know, when you were first trying flip, flipped, uh, a flipped classroom, I'm not sure if anyone else had really tried it here yet, and it was still considered very new, very cutting edge. There wasn't a whole mm -hmm. lot of, you know, support behind it for you. But I think it's the mark of a good teacher that you're willing to take risks, which means that there's also going to be mistakes and there's yep. going to be failures, and then you pick yourself up and learn from them. If you just lectured and gave the same old lectures and same old exams and assessments in the same old lecture theater year after year, I guess those people also just never make a mistake. I look at my own teaching and I. <laughs> Describe. I, I get. I don't know if I just get bored, I but get I, bored. I get tired of doing it the same way yeah. all the time. I, yeah. I like to change things up. It keeps yeah. it fresh and exciting for me. And even classes where I'm more, I have things set. I'll even just change the order of topics. I'll yeah. do things. Just in history. That's a little harder. <laughs> we're we're going to start from the present and work our way back. Although it'd be an interesting way to approach things. Um, but in political science, we can do things in different orders, yes. and I find that helps me discover new connections between ideas, mm -hmm. and it keeps it. Mm -hmm. fresh and interesting for me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be as, as little as that. Yeah, I'm going to make mistakes. And even in classes, so the multiple choice thing, it didn't go well. But I mean, the classes we had, we had some great discussions. I had some great classes with them. They were a really good bunch of students. And I felt bad, really bad about that exam. It still bothers me about mm -hmm. the final exam that mm -hmm. I gave them because this was a good, good group of students and mm -hmm. they deserve better than that. And mm -hmm. um, it'll be better next time. I learned a lot from that. And I Hopefully my students learn from me, but I do learn from them, like not just about politics, but mm -hmm. I learn a lot about teaching. Every time, every class I've ever taught, I've learned mm -hmm. something about teaching. And uh, yeah, yeah I, I think the minute I stop wanting to try things will be the time to retire. Yeah. I really do, yeah. when I've yeah. lost that passion to keep learning and keep trying yeah. new things. And that's a way to bring it back around to research. So we spend a lot of time talking about teaching um, and uh, it, it sometimes gets a bit separate from maybe our own research lives or the research life of the university. But in fact, for those of us who are really passionate teachers, there's often a very kind of symbiotic relationship back to the research. You just talked about your students help you see new connections, ask new questions. Um, how else can that relationship work that helping to raise the tide a little bit on teaching is in fact also supporting research? Well, I, I mean, I, I see it flowing both ways. So I'm sure. developing this, like, so my research leads into my teaching. So this course I'm doing new in uh, September directly ties to my research. So mm -hmm. I, I'm working on this paper for a conference that I have to get done by the end of this week, but it's, it's almost done. But I'm thinking, oh, how can I incorporate this into this yeah. class? This is really cool. There's a bunch of neat ideas. I'm really ex so, so I had a student do an independent study of this pasture where we're really talking about how digital politics is changing the way we, um, that citizens engage in information. One of the big things is, is youth engagement, right? And we're looking a lot at youth engagement and youth political, uh, youth political participation. And we have these fabulous conversations. Mm -hmm. And he came up with these really, and, and together we, just to our, it's come to my office once a week and we'd sit and talk for an hour about, uh, about these things. And we came up with these really, this really neat concept about how that people are, are more sort of self-creating their own sense set of things they're engaged in. And it's not maybe as broad as we would have where it's all really devoting in political parties, but mm -hmm. the three or four mm -hmm. things they really care about passionately that they've picked and selected and, 
and chosen. And those people, I, I would have more broad knowledge. But if I got, if I met these young people and, and we were talking about these areas, they'd know way more than I would mm -hmm, because they're mm -hmm. really passionate about this. So rather than saying, oh, kids these days don't care about <laughs> politics, it's, well, they care about a different set of issues than I do. And that really got me thinking about how we're approaching this research and looking at the kinds yeah. of questions yeah. we're doing, surveys of people about what they do online, that we need to get at that somehow. And that mm -hmm. came up from these conversations with a student, which is then going to feed back into this course, right, mm -hmm. where we where hopefully we'll gather some better data that I can help to use uh, to teach. So, yeah, if it's good, it's it's talking. And I think that's what sets us apart from high school or or even college teachers, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're scholars. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's a chance for us to talk with students about the things we really care about. Yeah and the things we're, we're passionate about. And, and when these things work together, it's, it's re really quite magical. Now, when we teach at a smaller institution like this and we have smaller faculty, we teach courses that are outside our areas yes. often. Yeah. But what can yeah. be funny is sometimes you'll end up doing research. So I taught a course on Canadian political parties for a long time, ever since I came here. It's the fourth year seminar. It was an area I'd done graduate work in and was related to elections and electoral systems. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was not too far a stretch for me to go there. But who knew? It started in uh, 2004. I started doing a big research project on political parties, <laughs> and I never would have known. But yeah. what was great about that, because I'd been teaching it for five or six years, it was pretty easy for me to switch over into that for research mm -hmm. because I already taught in the area um, and kept up on the literature. Mm -hmm. So it can prepare you to launch into all kinds of directions. Yeah, yeah, I think to so often when we talk about that relationship, it's perceived as just your research life allows you to bring new content to your students. Yeah. And I don't think that's it at all. No. You know, good teaching exposes you to people who ask good questions and demand things of you, and you then take that back to your work. I still remember, I, I mean, I've had students come up with paper ideas in fourth-year seminars that are just genius, and if I yeah. was much less ethical, I would steal them. <laughs> and, uh, publish the results as my own. And sometimes yeah. they're not always executed because, I mean, they're fourth-year students. They're not, they don't have PhDs and haven't had all the training that we've yeah. been yeah. fortunate enough to have. But I've almost wanted to steal them because yeah. they're like, wow, that's a yeah. really great research question. Yeah. I can't believe nobody's ever done this, yeah. right? Yeah. I've seen students come up with, like, what would be a perfect PhD thesis topic? Yes. Yeah, and just a different perspective on yeah. the work as well. Just because they're coming yeah. at things fresh. It's, it's exciting to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming and talking to me today. Uh, this, our, our outgoing board chair, Harold Jansen. Thank you.